There's no way around it. <laughs> if you praise God, if you praise God, despite your circumstances, despite your situation, your whole paradigm of how you view life is going to shift. You'll, you, your countenance will change. Your attitude will change. Do we go through difficult times? Yes. Does anybody like going through difficult times? No. It's super hard. It's difficult. It's painful. It's challenging. But, but it, 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 it's, in, it's in the difficult times and the difficult seasons of life that you can be aware and sense the love and the closeness of, of, of Abba Father, of Father God, in a way that you could never receive that love and that comfort when everything's going well. If you think you've blown it today, if you think that I don't know how I'm going to put the pieces of my life back together, I would encourage you to go back to the Old Testament and look at the children of Israel. Every time. I mean, they even got to the point where they basically, I'm paraphrasing here, but they basically threw God's word back in his face and said, no, we're not doing that. But he still had compassion on his people. He still showed favor to them. Are you going to go through bumps and bruises and, 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 and you know, having to be disciplined and learn, learn through the process of this was a wrong choice and there's consequences to the wrong choices you made? Of course. But ultimately, what does Isaiah 54 verse 17 say? No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Even a weapon that you form against yourself. <laughs> Living a wayward lifestyle. Ultimately, in God's overarching theme of his sovereign providence in your life and in the, the, the life of the world, his purposes will prevail. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You know, you don't have to be ashamed. You know, a little golf clap. It's OK. You know, just don't just don't just don't run around crazy. Start rolling around on the ground. <laughs> But, I mean, if you're led by the Holy Spirit, I mean, David danced himself out of his clothes. So, you know, stranger things have happened. But uh, it's very interesting. So I'll share this before we get into the message. I think it's, I think it's poignant, and I, and, and I believe the Holy Spirit had laid this on my heart. So I want to share it with, the, with you saints, with the congregation, with the church. This is a quote I'm reading here. It's from an article that was published. Uh, it was published actually this morning. The United Nations Population Fund, UNFPA, has warned of the nightmare situation facing the 50,000 pregnant women in Gaza. I think you guys are all aware of what's going on in the Middle East right now. If you're not aware of what's going on, you're living under a rock and you need to get up under that rock and figure out what's going on. Get your spiritual antennas up because there's a lot more going on than just... Silicon Valley and all the little issues that we deal with, not making light of the things that you're going through, but there's stuff going on around the world. 50,000 pregnant women in Gaza as the enclave's health system teeters on the brink of collapse. About 5,000 women are expected to give birth in the coming month, some of whom could face complications, says the UNFPA representative, representative Dominic Allen. These pregnant women that we're seriously concerned about have nowhere to go. They're facing unthinkable challenges, he told CNN in an interview on Sunday. When I read that, when I read that, you know, I got to decipher, okay, Lord, <laughs> is it my flesh? Is it you? Is it an unclean spirit? I believe the Lord showed me. I don't believe it was me and my flesh. I don't believe it was an unclean spirit. It makes me think of Matthew chapter 24, verse 19. Some of you may be familiar with this passage. It is the Olivet Discourse and what was going to happen when the abomination of desolation would occur. If this is what Jesus was talking about, not talking about what I just read, but he's talking about, if you read that passage, uh, verse 19 says, woe to those who will give birth during that time. Woe to those. Like it's going to be very bad if you're pregnant and you're having to give birth during that time of the abomination of desolation. If, if any of you are not familiar with that, that is when the final Antichrist will go into the temple and he will basically not do good things there. He will set himself up as the Messiah. He will deceive many and many will be deceived. 
If this is bad news now for pregnant women, I can't even imagine what that time will look like. But this is honestly, we honestly don't know. We don't even know if we are on the brink of the abomination of desolation to actually occur. We don't know. It has been reported that the attack from Hamas on Israel is the worst since Hitler and the Holocaust. If you've been following over there, Gaza's done. It's done. There's over 2 million people they're saying evacuate, but they may not even make it out. There's no running water. <laughs> the, the, the health aid is, is, is gone, and it's just people dying. So we know it's serious, right? It, 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 if any time, this is, this, this is the perfect time to be a praying people. If you believe that Christ, if the Holy Spirit who raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in you, then that same Holy Spirit, you have the power and the authority given by Father God to intercede for people who need it. Many people say, well, what can I do? My life, what does my life count for? Your life counts for a whole lot. If you've been given breath in your lungs and you've woken up this morning, then the Lord saw it fit for you to live another day so he could get honor and glory from your life and so you could understand more and more what your ultimate purpose is here on earth. And it is to glorify God and to have unhindered, complete fellowship with him. Amen. Amen. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit has to say to the churches. I love that verse, man. That's why I quote it all the time. Because... We, we got to have ears to hear. And I'm not talking about the ears on our side of our skull. I believe that, that that verse is talking about your inner person, the inner workings of who you really are. Is your heart tuned in to what the Lord has for you? You see, it takes a matter of effort on our part. We're not saved by good works. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about God has given everyone a will. You see what the will can do. The will of a person can do great and mighty things. It can also be very destructive and deadly. So hear with your heart today, your inner person, what the Spirit of God has to say to you. Amen. Amen. This morning we'll begin Ecclesiastes chapter 5. I, I, I love being in this book. <laughs> this book is just so eye-opening. It, it, it just peels back the onion layers of life and it shows you what, what, is, what, is, what, what, what is the reality of things. You see, as long as we're disillusioned and we're not understanding what's of real value and importance, we're going to struggle to figure out what to follow after. We're just going to be like, do I go here? Do I go there? Do I listen to this voice? Do I listen to that voice? But when you simply humble yourself, don't esteem your opinion over God's authority and allow the Lord to speak to you through his word unbiased. Then you begin to understand, OK, here we go. Now I'm getting direction. Now I'm getting revelation. Now I'm understanding what life is truly all about. And so that's what we've been learning in the, the book of Ecclesiastes, that ultimately it's about having a, a true relationship with the Lord. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with money. Nothing wrong with being wealthy. Nothing wrong with having, uh, you know, accolades. There's nothing wrong with having hobbies and enjoying things in life. But those are so not primary. <laughs> the primary purpose of life is to have sweet, unhindered fellowship with Father God through His Son, Jesus Christ. That's why He went to the cross and died and rose from the dead so that no longer can sin or death or hell have any place in between you and Him. That you can have full communion as much as you possibly can this side of heaven. And then when you get to heaven, it's going to be that much sweeter because no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor has it ever entered into the heart of man what is prepared for him, for those who love Jesus Christ. Don't, do you get up for that? Man, I'm so juiced off of what the Lord has for me. I'm juiced off what he has for me now. Like this is like... I don't do this for money. <laughs> I definitely don't do this for fame. I don't do this for accolades. I do this because I'm trying to live out my calling and I figured out, okay, or the Lord showed me this is what I'm supposed to do. So that's why I'm juiced up here. You know, I don't drink coffee no more, so it ain't caffeine talking. I don't do energy drinks, so it ain't no energy drink talking. You know, I do have some electrolyte drink, but, you know, it ain't the electrolytes talking. It's the Holy Spirit running through my veins. 
But we're in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. We're going to go through verses 1 through 3. Strap in today because this, 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 this uh, message ain't no joke. The message is entitled Fear God, Part 1. When you get there, please uh, stand for the reading of God's word if you're able to. And once again, we'll be in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. Don't worry, I'll make a disclaimer. What you think fearing God is probably is not at all what, you, uh, what the Bible says, but we'll get into that as we draw into the scripture. So it says, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they are doing evil. Be not rash with your mouth. Do not let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For a dreamer comes with much busyness and a fool's voice with many words. Let's go ahead and pray. Yahweh, we praise you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. Thank you that you, you, are, you are kind to us and that you are compassionate and that, Lord, you don't hold these things against us. You know that we're but dust. And your desire is that we would be made whole, holy into the likeness and the image of your son, Jesus, that we would be uh, not corrupted by the world and by the things of the world or even by our sinful nature, but we, we would inherit your holiness and that we would be able to dwell in your presence all the days of our lives. So, Father, I pray that you would give us a fresh anointing, that you would give us clear understanding of your word. Help me to rightfully divide your word. May may what comes out of my mouth be from you, and may it not be of my own opinion or my own understanding, but but may it be revelation from the Holy Spirit of God. Father, we thank you and we praise you. It's in your son Jesus Christ's precious name that we pray. Amen. All right, so last week we wrapped up chapter 4. And, and we learned that, that two are better than one. You know, it's like a Twix. <laughs> you know, who likes them single Twix? I don't like them single little Twix. I want two. Maybe give me four. Give me king size. Now you got more to share, more to go around. When you got one, it's like you got to break one off. I ain't going to satisfy nobody's sweet tooth. You know, like Twix. Two are better than one. You see, being part of the body of Christ means that we are involved in one another's lives. This was a radical thing for me as I, as I begin to get mature in Christ because I'm a recluse by nature. I'm solo bolo. I don't want to deal with nobody. I don't want to be around nobody. Let me, let, me, let me make my beats. Let me watch my football. Let me chill with my wife. My wife is the total opposite. She's, she's all into community. She's super social. She's the social butterfly. And it's taken many years for me to, to kind of learn and understand that, 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 that that's the Christian life. Like... You know, I can't say that I love God and I don't love people like it doesn't equate. Like if you're like, I don't want nothing to do with you, but I just want to have Jesus to myself. That's not the Christian life that, that you're, bo- you're you're teetering on, on on cult activity right there. You know, <laughs> you truly are because because nowhere in the Bible do you see men and women of God in solitude forever by themselves. Now, Jesus went away for solitude to pray. That's, that's, don't, you know, we, we don't want to mince the words and take the Bible out of context. But clearly, I mean, he hung out with prostitutes. He, hang, he hung out with tax collectors. He hung around with, you know, with people that were the dregs of society. And Christ didn't have no shame about being around those people. So, and look at, look at the ragtag group that became disciples. So he was all about community. He was all about immersing himself in the community and being amongst people. And we as the body of Christ need to do the same. The benefits of being connected to his church and his body far outweigh being apart from them. Do you understand when you're connected to the body of Christ, when you're in community with other believers, you grow strong in your spirit. You gain insight, you gain wisdom, you gain revelation that you never would have gained had you been alone by yourself. And you can affirm that this is the right thing because other believers that are more mature than you will show you through the Holy Spirit that yes, you're going the right way or no, you're going the wrong way. When you're solo bolo by yourself, you may think you're having revelation of God and maybe you do to a certain extent. But how can you rightly divide the word if you don't have others around you that can help you? Iron sharpens iron, says the word of God, not I do it all by myself and I have my personal relationship with Jesus. Now, when we stand before him, we're going to stand alone. 
But that has nothing to do with down here being on earth, being sent out two by two into the world to preach and teach and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those around us. It's so important to be in communion. Think about this. We learned this last week. Within the Godhead itself, Father God, the Son, who is Jesus Christ, and the person of the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, there is communion. There is a common union. They are all equal in holiness, but unique and separate in their different descriptions and what they are called to do. But there is communion within them. You see, and we are created with this same kind of makeup to be in communion. God did not create us to be lone rangers. He created us to be in fellowship. Even when you take it back to people who, don't, who, who had their own far out ideas of who God was, the natives of the land and this and that, they still had community. Every people group, every, every native uh, tribe and group on the face of the earth had community. You look at Israel. It, it was only the lepers that were outcasted. And even with, amongst the lepers, they still had community. It's like, well, we all look the same. Our fingers are falling off and our ears are falling off. We roll together. <laughs> and maybe we'll get blessed and get healed. And we can get back into bigger group. But we still had a crew. A crew. Think about people who are in gangs. Why do people join gangs? Because they need community. They need fellowship. They need family. They're not getting it in a broken home. So they go out in the streets or they get recruited and they become family with other people. Okay, well, we're going to pimp, do drugs, do this and that. Go gang bang, do drive-by shootings, loot, loot, pillage, steal. But it's still community. It's still family. It may be in all the wrong ways, but it's still family. So this is embedded in the, the fiber of who you and I are. We also learn that it's far better to be young, poor, and wise than to be wealthy, rigid, and an old fool. So if you're in here, if you're young and you're not making $500,000 a year, but you got some wisdom up in there, then you're better off than someone who's an old miser who makes $2.5 million a year and they're rigid. You're better off than them. <laughs> you see, walk by faith, not by sight. So many times we're, we're, we're basing our worth on what we see. We're basing our worth on our circumstances. Do you, do you understand that, 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 that driving a Rolls Royce doesn't make you proper? <clears throat> having, a, having a husband that has six-pack abs, eight-pack abs, and, 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 and big enough biceps to, 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 you know, to strangle out you know, Hulk Hogan don't make you significant? That, that your wife don't have to have a size three figure and, 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 and have a chest that bounces out to where she can't even see her feet? <laughs> I'm just being, I'm just keeping it real. That, that, that doesn't make you significant as a man. Do, do you understand that, church? That, that, that your identity comes from Christ. Your identity comes from God who created you. Don't, don't view your worth. Don't value yourself based on what the world system tells you. This is what it is to be a woman. This is what it is to be a man. Because they can't even tell you what it is to be a man or a woman anymore because the lines are so blurred. Men are becoming women and women are becoming men. Wow. How do we do this? <laughs> you can't, even if you try to change your anatomy and go to some doctor, you were still created how you came out. You, you, you can't tell me any different. The Bible is clear about this stuff. And it doesn't matter if your opinion is, I don't like that. The, 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 but there's, there's plenty of things. But let me, not, let me digress. Let me stay on track. It's far better for you to be young and poor than to be wealthy and rigid. It's not all about money. The Lord will provide for you everything you need if you put him first in your life. Today we will begin to unpack chapter 5 in the book of Ecclesiastes, looking at the importance of fearing God. There's, this is a, such an important aspect of, of any Christian's walk with Christ, walk with Father God. We have several main points. This is the first one. God bless you, sir. I don't know if Lou's here, but that's a grown man sneeze. When you hear Lou sneeze, it's like, boo. It's like a grizzly bear. Boo, boo. Shake the room, man. That's a grown man sneeze. Daniel, you got a grown man sneeze, too. All right. This is the first main point, church. The reverence and fear 
we have of God in his house must first be in us before we step inside. I'll say it again. The reverence and fear that you and I have for God, it has to be in us before we walk in this door. The definition of reverence is this. The noun says deep respect for someone or something. The verb says regard or treat with deep respect. Quite frankly, there is a serious lack of this in many people today. Having a reverence, having a, having a common respect for humanity, for people. You see, there, there, there is simply a degrading of common respect and courtesy in the world we live in. But this shouldn't be a surprise to us that are maturing in the faith because the Bible foretells these kind of things would happen. We were talking about that as we left prayer this morning. Matthew chapter 24 verse 12 says, And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. It's what I see a lot. Yes, there are people that are loving. And and praise God for that. Praise God for those who have been convicted and see the importance of sharing the love of Christ with those around them. But there also seems to be just a heaviness of this lawlessness going on in the world we live in today. And the love of many is definitely waxing or growing cold. When you think about it, when you trace it back, whether for good or for evil, this all starts within the home. Within the home. Think of it this way. Yahweh, or Father God, has an order of how he created human beings. There's an order. He's, he, he, he's a God of order and organization. You see, God created Adam first and then Eve. We all know the account. He created Adam from the dust you know, my son's like, oh, like Plato. Oh, yeah, kind of like that. From the dust. Breathe spirit of life into him, right? Through his nostrils. And now he has life. Now he's not just a cadaver, but he has a living soul inside of him. And what did he do? One day when he was asleep, you know, took a rib out, made Eve. He's like, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Wow. You know, first woman, not ashamed, naked. He couldn't believe what he saw. Man, made for him. But there was an order. God created Adam, then He created Eve. What does this mean? We need to look deeper into the text to find out what this means. It means this. The Lord expects men to take the lead of spiritual submission to him. That is, if you're married. If you're single, you're kind of off the hook. Not really. You still need to submit to him. But this is speaking to married men as Adam was joined with Eve. Right? They became one flesh. The Lord expects men to take the lead of spiritual submission to him. That men would not wait to be told to, but would willfully submit to God and humble themselves under his authority. That's what created order means. It's not Eve do it, then my then then Adam does it. The same thing as the Trinity. Adam is no better than Eve. Adam is no greater than Eve. They are equal with separate functions. I don't think I need to give a a sex ed class, but you need the sperm and the egg. Adam can't have babies. Eve can have babies. She's not greater than him because she can have a baby. Adam's no greater than her because he's called to submit first. Either way, the order is Adam was created first, then Eve. So Eve shouldn't be submitting before Adam. Adam needs to get his butt in gear and submit to the Lord. Excuse my French. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3 says, But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband. And the head of Christ is God, speaking of Father God. Obviously, you can tell I'm very passionate about this. This is serious business. Meaning the husband and the father of a family must first have a holy fear of God in his own personal relationship with God. God. Many times that is lacking and the lack of fear of God in the husband and the father of the home bleeds over and manifests itself into the lives of those under him. I've seen it too many times. I've seen it in my own life. I'm speaking from my own experience. 
When I'm not living right before the Lord, I'm going to tell you right now, all hell breaks loose in my home. Because my wife's not supposed to be the one doing all that. And, and if, as the husband, if you're not submissive before God, you're putting such a strain on your marriage that it's, it's, an, it's unnecessary. And it puts the marriage through strain and stress that it shouldn't go through. You see, many are in a great disposition already because many families are, are in fact, missing a husband or a father. And, 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 and the mother has to play the role of, 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 of father as well. And that's not fair. That's hard. Think about all the single moms in the world. Think about, we'll just, let's narrow it down to our, let's narrow it down to our state. Let's narrow it down to our county, Santa Clara County. Think of all the single moms you see in different sides of town over here. Be it east side, north side, south side, you know, west side, here in Milpitas. There's single moms all over the place. And that's a difficult thing. That's a challenging thing. So I, I am not poking at that. I am not, I am not throwing them under the bus at all. If anything, my heart, I have compassion towards them because I understand how much they have to go through and how hard it is. But you see, this is a, this is a direct result of the man not taking his proper role. And just siring a child and say, oh, yeah, we slept together. I had a baby with you, but I don't want nothing to do with you. Go, you do your thing, kick rocks. Instead of being like, okay, I need to wife you up. And then we need to be together. We need to raise this child and do it the right way. Many men don't do what they're supposed to do. And if these single parent families are not around biblical principles what do you think is going to happen they're already at a great disposition because the man's not there now if the, the, the if the mother's not living for christ then man it's now is super difficult now you got a double whammy the man's not around then the mom's not saved so it's like i'm not saying she can't get saved what i'm saying is it, it's just it's hard this is a hard predicament to be in and it traces all the way back to sin that the, the creation got out of order and out of whack and it went chaotic so if the head of the home lacks a holy fear of God, many times the family unit lacks it as well. Or if the wife has a holy fear of God and does her best to impart that to their children, then there's hope. While this is good, because the husband and father is not assuming his proper role within the family unit, it creates, again, an unhealthy balance and an unwanted stress arises within the marriage and in the home in general. Can I be candid with you? Don't share it with my wife. I'm just being real. But that, that's one of the reasons why my wife retired. Because, because she needed to do what she needed to do within our family and for the church. And we had to trust though that she made more money than me. She made good money. She worked for a private practice, you know, for many years. And um, I don't make that much money. But we, we had to trust the Lord and say, you know what? I believe that you're calling my wife out of work to be in the home and to do what she needs to do for the women of the church and just the, and the children and the church in general to do your work. And I believe you're going to provide the means for us to, to survive. And that was a big thing for us. That was a big step that was a big challenge. That was a big ask. But the Lord provided. And our home is so much better for it. There's so, I mean, yes, do we have whatever things come up? And of course, we're, we're two sinners that are saved, married. So I'm not going to say there's never no quarrels or bickering or whatever. But there is a peace in my home that was not there before my wife retired. And I would not, I would not change that for the world. That's not in my notes that's just something I felt that I needed to share to be clearly transparent with you, that I don't sit up here boasting as if I got it all together. No, I do not. I'm speaking from experience when I'm talking about this church. You see, reverence for God in his house starts way before you even step foot in the church building. If it is lacking or non-existent, in your personal daily life, you will not magically have a deep reverence and fear of God when you come to the church house. You can't drum it up. This is not, some, this is not a drama act. This is not something you can fake. If you're not raw and real before God in your personal life, 
there's no way you're going to come in here and just all of a sudden you're, you're just like, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm good with you, Lord, and praise you. And this. No, it's not going to happen. The, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It'll be evident and clear. You can't fool anybody in this building because we all share the same Holy Spirit. I tell that to all the men every time. I said, I can't, I can't bull you because you share the same Holy Spirit that I share. So if I'm lying, if I'm not right, you're going to know something's off with Pastor Keith. Something's off with that dude right now. Sure enough, if it is, there is. But if it's not and I'm squeaky clean and I'm good to go in Christ, then it's like, no, I'm above reproach. I'm the Teflon man. You can't touch me. We should all be like that, like the Teflon pan. I heard a message about that earlier. That's something that's something different. That's if someone aspires to be an elder in the church, you better be a Teflon man. Nothing should be able to stick. No accusation should ever be able to stick to you. They can say, oh, this did do the X, Y, and Z. Nah, you didn't catch me at the Matrix, homeboy. I was not gambling. I don't do that. You didn't see me at the strip, strip club. I don't do that. I don't care what accusation you throw. I should be like Teflon. It should just fall off. That's a whole other subject. But anyways, it's food for thought. And just as a believer, you don't have to have to assume eldership in the church. You just as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, you should be living in a way that is above reproach. That whatever they put upon you, they can't stick. They try to defame your character. It ain't going to stick. You shouldn't be stressed out. It's like, oh, they say, oh, Susie said X, Y, and Z about Katie. You don't know me, girl. Who do you think I am? I didn't sleep around. No, it don't stick. You got nothing on me. Haters love to hate. They're going to make accusations. <laughs> Sam Byatt and Tobias. They were all about that with Nehemiah, trying to make it stick. An example is this. Okay, think about this. How, 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 can, how can any preacher be qualified to preach and teach the congregation if they themselves are not living in a state of holy fear before their creator? How? How can, how, how can someone stand up here and talk? How can someone stand up here and dare say the things out of their mouths if they're not living a holy reverent, with a holy reverent fear of God in their personal lives? How can any Christian live guiltless and a blameless life? Unless you have a holy, reverent fear of God. You're going to feel guilty for every little thing that comes in your mind. Unless you have a holy fear of God. How can you live blameless? I just talked about that, the whole Teflon thing. You're going to be blameless if you have a holy fear of God. You see, a holy fear of God automatically will put everything else in its proper order. <laughs> Did you get that? That, 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 is, that, is, that is how it works. When you have, and, and sh we should re re have reverence for God, but, but a fear of God is way deeper than a reverence of God. A reverence is like, okay, it's the president of the United States. Everybody stand up. That's why we stand here. That's a tradition that we hold to. It's not in the Bible, but we stand because if people stand for the president of the United States, I think people should better stand for the reading of God's word because God far outweighs Trump, Biden, anybody who comes after them. Ronald Reagan, even the good ones, you know, Roosevelt, whatever. <laughs> God far outweighs all them presidents, man. So that's why we stand because we have a holy fear of him. That's why we get low too. That's why people get in the posture of getting on their knees or even better yet, I know Daniel says it all the time, getting prostrate before God. Getting on your face, prostrate before God. Not prostate, not prostate cancer. <laughs> but you get low as you can, as quick as you can. I love what Charles Stanley said. Her, I'll never forget that, that sermon I heard from him. He said, you better get down as quick as you can, as low as you can, as quick as you can before God. And that's how we should stay. That's a lifestyle decision that we make. You see, but if you don't have a holy fear of God, there's no order in your life. Let me tell you that right now. If you do not have a holy fear of God, you have every kind of disorder in your life. First Timothy chapter three, verse five says, for if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? Again, we see there, there's order. There's order that happens. And, and, and we all must. And you can't even have your house in order unless you get in order with God first. Speaking to the men here, women, you're not off the hook because you got to do your own thing, too. But the men have to do their thing. I, I, tell, I tell the men every, every, every week when I'm there, I said, if we don't meet, this ain't a church. This is just a social club. 
And it's not knocking the women. It's not taking anything away from the women. But if you don't have solid godly men in the church, in their rightful position, in their rightful place, under the authority and the headship of God, you don't have a church. Look at the Bible. Look what it says. The men have to assume the position. You have to. If you have strong, godly men, you have a strong, vibrant, healthy church. It's not about numbers. It's about health. It's about the spiritual well-being. It's are you maturing? Are you growing in the things of God? Is the nature of God manifesting itself more and more in you, in your everyday life, in your choices, in your thinking, in the way that you do things? That's what you should be seeing. That's how you should view what's going on in your life. The second main point is this. Better to draw near to God and listen rather than to make sacrifices foolishly. There is a quietness and a stillness that must be in our soul. We should never come before the Lord running our mouths. You see, I never understood this way back in the day. I'd be in a prayer circle and like, I'm like, dude, why is so quiet, man? <laughs> why are these cats so quiet? Why is not someone starting to talk? But I didn't understand that they were quieting themselves before the Lord. They weren't rushing in and just uh, started rattling off, talking. You know, what? at least in my day, what people would say, you're talking out the side of your neck. You're just talking, rambling. They would quiet themselves before God. Again, this is directly tied to having a healthy, holy fear of God. This is recognizing that he is the all-knowing creator God, and we are not. So many of us have such a hard difficult time just sitting and listening (laughs) we're like we tune out (laughs) i don't care what the statistics say oh 20 minutes and somebody tunes out i mean dude tell that to paul tell that to tell that to the young man i mean he had he was preaching all day all night and that young man fell out the the house he fell out the roof or the you know the window and then you know through the power of god you know uh the holy spirit through paul was used him to raise him up and he, he he resurrected but it's like you know, we, we say, oh, it's so modern that, you know, you got to shorten it down. Well, I'll go by what the Holy Spirit says. So maybe I'll have a shorter message, but, you know, the Holy Spirit speaking through a person, the Holy Spirit speaking. But we have a hard time sitting and being still. We're fidgety. We're, I mean, you can't take it. Get a fidget spinner. Do something to keep yourself occupied in that seat. But we're going to preach. We're going to talk about the word of God. Many times in prayer, we just rush in and start talking to God. You see, our minds are so preoccupied with many other things besides actually spending time with the Lord. Have you ever found yourself in that position? You're trying to pray, and yet you're being bombarded with all kinds of other things. And it's like, bro, Lord, I just need to focus. (laughs) I just need to focus on you. I'm over here. Why am I thinking of Brock Purdy right now? (laughs) Lord, I'm trying to focus on you, man. I ain't tripping off number 13. I'm over here, you know, thinking about Krispy Kremes and I don't know what else, the tri-tip steak, you know. Tomahawk steak. I don't even eat tomahawk steak. What am I thinking about? But yeah, we're, we're in here and, and we're not focused on just spending quality time with the Lord. We must remember that prayer is a conversation. It's not a monologue. Yes, we will speak to the Lord, but do we actually sit long enough in prayer to allow him to speak back to us? We're so quick to tell. Da, 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 da. And uh, peace, God. I'm out. But it's like, he's like, where'd you go? Where'd you go, my son? Where'd you go, my daughter? I was trying to impart some wisdom to you. I was trying to impart some revelation to you, but you just got up and left. All of us, including myself, need to grow at being still before God. Today, can you clearly distinguish his voice from your own voice and from the voice of an unclean spirit? Can can you clearly disseminate between the three? That's something that we all need to grow in, being able to know when the Holy Spirit's speaking, knowing when it's just our flesh. Because sometimes we could be like, oh, it's the Lord. It's your flesh, man. That's your flesh. If you said, oh, I want to go on this vacation. And then just because you have the money in the bank, you're like, I prayed about it. The Lord confirmed it. Did the Lord confirm it? Or is that just your desire? You want to fulfill your own desire. You see what I'm saying? We need to be able to, to disseminate between the three. We need to develop this skill. And you can, de- you, be- you can begin to develop this skill by sitting still before him, right? 
You can put on some calm worship music and simply praise God in your innermost being. You don't need to say anything out loud. You can if you want, but you don't need to. Just focus on praising him for his goodness, his mercy, and his grace. So many times we we bring a laundry list of what we want or what we think we need, but we're not praising him. We're not giving him the adoration that he deserves. We're not just thanking him for the breath in our lungs. We're not just thanking him for allowing us to to be alive and and to be able to think and to be able to have a sober mind and for cleansing us of our sin and giving us the gift of eternal life. We tend to, to minimize those things and we make it all about us. That's why I love that song that Michelle sang last week. It's all about you, Lord. It's all about you. Forgive me for what I made it. Forgive me for what I may worship. It's not about that stuff. I love that song because it talks about he don't want a song. He don't care about a song. Man, David wrote a gang of songs. He don't need more. <laughs> he wants your heart. He wants my heart. He wants my innermost being to be locked in alignment with him. And when you develop a habit of doing this, sitting still before the Lord, in his time, he will reveal to you whatever it is he wants to convey to you. But we we must be willing to sit still before him. We just need to develop patience. I know it's hard, but that's why it's called patience. Because it's something that you develop you know, I deal with this a lot with my, with my children. It's like, I got to have patience. <laughs> I got to have patience with them. Psalm 46 verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted amongst the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. If you and I are simply in a rush and want to give our sacrifice to him, it is considered foolish in his sight. That's why I don't, I don't even talk about money in this church. <laughs> the offering thing, it stays back there. We used to do the offering where the, you know, the ushers come and they take it down the row. To me, personally, I believe the Lord showed me that's a personal thing. And I don't want something to, someone to feel inferior or feel down or intimidated because they happen to see somebody gave X, Y, and Z. And they're like, man, I got like, I got like $2. I got like $2 to give. So I was like, you know what? We don't talk about it. It is what it is. It's the Lord's church. He'll keep the doors open. I leave it back there and I make it personal. You do it before your God. I don't want to see. Even when I put the checks into the, 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 the ATM, I, I don't look at who did what. I don't want to know. I have Daniel do that and, and Keith if he's here or Eric, somebody else, because I, I don't need to touch that stuff. I got no business. It's not me. That's between them and the Lord. But the whole point is don't rush to do it. He considers your sacrifices foolish If you're not in a right place before him, we say the same thing about communion. Don't rush in and take that juice and take that cracker before you do business with the Lord. So, you know, you're not bringing judgment upon yourself when you're taking those things, those elements, those sacraments in a foolish, in a in a flippant manner. Growing in wisdom is proven in knowing when to speak and when to be silent. Third main point. We would all be wise to let our words be few before God. This is such a convicting message for me because I tend to speak a lot. (laughs) But the real deeper issue here is not only that one would speak many words, but that one would not one would not be harsh or hasty with the words they speak before God. You see, every time you and I open our mouths, it can become a slippery slope. The Bible says, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, whatever is in our hearts is going to translate into our words and our actions. And we must learn that everything we think should not be spoken out loud. There's many times I'm up here and something pops in my mind, but then the Lord shuts my mouth about it and I don't speak on it because it wasn't to be spoken about. James chapter three, verse eight says, no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Perfect example of this is the account of the Pharisees, the Pharisee, the tax collector um, in the temple. Remember, the Pharisee came in. He said, I praise you, Lord God. I I praise you, Jehovah. I'm not like none of the rest of these sinners. He's running his mouth. He's praising God because he's not like all these people. And the poor tax collector, he knew the blood on his hands and he couldn't even lift his couldn't even lift his face to heaven. He, He was humbled by the fact that he was 
in the Lord's house. He was in the presence of Yahweh God and, and that he does not deserve anything for what he's done. Who went away justified, Jesus said. The tax collector, right? Because he humbled himself. He didn't run up, running his mouth, loose lipping, talking out the side of his neck, acting as though he was so great. I'm not like the rest of these people. No. He said the one that was of lowly spirit, of a contrite heart, the one that couldn't even lift his, his, his face to heaven. You know, sometimes I know that you guys go through it too because I go through it. Sometimes I can sing boldly in here. And there's other times where I'm, I'm like crying. I'm like holding back tears. I start off the first verse cool and then I get to the, to the chorus and I'm over here. I broke down. I can't, even, I can't even sing because I'm either convicted or I'm overwhelmed by the presence of the Lord. And it's like I just I can't mutter anything out. It's just tears because my heart is heavy because I know he's so good and I'm so unworthy of his goodness. You see, God is looking for honesty, not long-winded prayers. You know, we can actually sound spiritual and actually be spiritually dead. It's not the length of the prayer that matters, rather the intent of the heart behind the words that matter to God. You don't have to go, oh, oh, Lord, God. And I'm not making fun. I'm just saying. It's just like you just talk. Like you're talking to your homie, but there's a holy fear because it's not your homie. It's God. But you talk to him in that same way where it's like somebody you're close to. You talk to your father, talk to your mother, talk to your brother, talk to your sister. You talk to God in that same kind of way. You don't gotta you don't gotta memorize all these different words to have a communication with the Lord. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and break down these verses with the remainder of our time. Okay, again it says starting in verse one, guard your steps when you go into the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that what they are doing is evil. Do not be rash with your word, with your mouth, excuse me, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For a dream comes with much busyness and a fool's voice with many words. Okay, so we see this first, this first point. Guard your steps or walk, in, or walk prudently when you go into the house of God. How is our character when we enter this building? Just stop and think about that for a minute. I know that, that Sunday mornings can be busy, and I've come in where it's like, dude, I'm not. First thing I got to do is I, I get down on my knees and I pray. No one's here. I get down, I pray. God, like, Lord, help me. It's been one of them mornings. It's been difficult. It's been challenging. But how is, our, how is our character when we enter God's house? Are we humbled and lowly, or are we brash and boastful? You see, it's a sobering thing to come into the house of the Lord. You see, we, we don't necessarily, uh, we, we don't get this glimpse because we live in 2023. But back in the day day, when you would go into the church house, before you went into the church house on the property, there would be a cemetery and you would see headstones and you would see people deceased in graves before you went into the steps of the church house. And when you left God's house, before you got to your car to go to your house, you would see that same cemetery after you came out of the house of God. I can only imagine how sobering that walk to and from the church house would be each week. Because you're seeing the brevity of life. We just have a building. You come in and out this building and it's like, oh, it's just a loop. It's just a loop. I go from reverency God to it's the loop. I want an icy. I want a churro. I want a chimichanga. They selling all that over. I want taquitos. The reverence just went out the door real quick. You were holier than that a minute ago. And now it's, and then it's just all about taquitos. <laughs> but you see, that's what we contend with on a spiritual plane where we're at in the world we live in today. Even apart from eternity, it would be wise to honor God and walk prudently when you go into the house of the Lord for the sake of this life alone. Proverbs chapter 13, verse three says, whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. The definition of prudent is this acting with or showing care and thought for the future 
To be prudent means to consciously think about how your life and how you live before the God of all creation actually is. It's to consider it. It's to just not be just doing it on autopilot. You see, back in the day, children would tease one another and say things like, she's such a prude, or he's such a goody two-shoes. Which is crazy, because by the world culture, you would be put down for doing the right thing, but celebrated for living a life of sin. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 22 says, Good sense is a fountain of life to him who has it, but the instruction of fools is folly. To be prudent means to have good sense and to walk circumspectly. An example of this, to live your Christian life, you truly must be aware of every step you take. And I know some people say it's too hard. It's too hard. Jesus says, Take my yoke upon you. (laughs) His burden is easy. It's light. He won't leave you to do it alone. What you can't do through his strength, you can do. Today, are you truly consciously aware of the direction your life is heading? Right now. Don't tell me, but this is a personal inventory. Are you consciously aware right now? Of the direction your life is spiritually heading. Are you being decisive with the choices you make on a daily basis? Or are you on autopilot simply going with the flow. Never going against the current. If it opposes the ways of God. I got this picture in my mind. Um, I talked to my brother a a couple weeks ago when I had my birthday, one of my older brothers, and it was super cool. He was talking about walking circumspectly, so I'm using this illustration. It's not me. It came from him. But picture a cat walking from one end of the room to the other with the wooden floor covered with marbles, but the cat doesn't touch any marble at all. That's walking circumspectly. A cat is very deliberate with every movement they make. That's why they're able to walk in a room like that and not touch any marble because it's very, it's very direct. They're actually putting thought into it. Okay, I got to go this way. I got to this way. <laughs> they got to do all this little thing and they got their, their tail keeping their balance. We, church, must be that way with the choices that you and I make on a daily basis. Concerned about how you and I live before an omnipresent God. You see, when we try to go do something and think we're getting away with it, God's there. We're not getting away with it. So walk circumspectly and make sure you don't allow yourself to be deceived into thinking, oh, I can get away with this because nobody's looking. God's always looking. Forget big brother. I care about big brother. I'm talking about, I'm talking about big God. <laughs> He's looking, he's seeing, he's seeing everything. He knows what you're going to do before you even do it. And he's going to try to convince you, don't go that route. This is like Jiminy Cricket with Pinocchio. Bro, don't smoke them cigarettes. Don't go with them wolves. But, you know, Pinocchio want to do his own thing. Don't be like Pinocchio, man. Don't be (laughs) wooden-headed. Have a heart of flesh. Now, I'm not bashing. Rather, I'm simply pointing out. Have you ever noticed... Many people who don't serve Jesus Christ as Lord, God bless you. If they're invited to a church service, um, they're typically reverent when they are in the building. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, they may curse every other word. (laughs) They may take the Lord's name in vain. They may be chain smokers. They may be drinkers. They may be pot smokers, whatever. They may be into X, Y, and Z. But while they are here in the building, they refrain from doing those things or acting that way. You want to know why? It's because deep down in the pit of their hearts, they are conscious and they recognize the holiness of who God is. This is actually a good thing. It's really bad when people have a seared conscience and don't have any fear of God at all. The application is this. If you are truly guarding your steps before you enter into God's house, it actually starts way before you get here. We talked about this at links earlier, so I won't get too into it. 
But again, being the husband and father of a family, the fear of God has to be in its proper order so it will trickle down accordingly. Meaning, if you don't already have a holy fear of God in your daily life, you can't expect to all of a sudden get all reverent on a Sunday morning for several hours and then go back to living in the flesh the rest of the day. Before we can experience the fullness of the love that God has for us, we need to have a healthy, holy fear of Him. You see, many of us are like, I, 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 I'm not experiencing the breakthrough. I'm not experiencing the love of God on a massive scale. But do you have a holy fear of Him? Have you laid your life down for His cause? Have you given over everything? If you have, then that's what's going to usher in the abundant love that he has for you. An example of this is once upon a time, parents actually spanked their kids. I know that many parents are afraid to spank their kids or they just give, they, you know, I get the words of affirmation, but they use words instead. Or they say, oh, we, we have colors. <laughs> we do this. So you got all these methodologies of how to, how to discipline children. The Bible says, do, you know, it's okay you spank your kid man it's actually a good thing if you if you withhold it you don't love them you see we call it a pow pow in our house <laughs> oh you can get a pow pow man don't let him the chunkla the chunkla <laughs> bam bam you're gonna get it but you know we use it to address unwanted behavior if warnings of words do not get through first, we, we, we don't go reach for the, the pow pow or the belt or the chancla. We, 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 we go with, hey, man, do this. <laughs> get out of that way of thinking. But now you want to rebel like a sinner. OK, now we're going to have to we're going to have to deal with it again. It is biblical that children have a healthy fear of their parents and if they do, they will walk upright. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24 tells us, Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. See, many of us today, maybe you're in a season of life where you feel like I've been shafted by God. I don't understand, but I'm in the wilderness and it's not cool and I don't like it and it's not pleasant and I don't feel the presence of God in my life and I'm dealing with consequences in my life and I'm being disciplined. Take heart that God disciplines those he loves. You see, he's all loving, but he's also all holy. So if we go against his holiness, there's going to be consequences to our actions. doesn't mean he loves us any less. It's just like a parent that loves the children. A parent that loves his or her child is not going to let his or her child eat 10 hostess cupcakes and call it a day and be all good with it. There's going to be repercussions from eating what they weren't supposed to eat or taking what they weren't supposed to take. Like a child that has a healthy fear of their parents, we must too have a healthy fear of God. When we have a true understanding of what the Bible actually says about having the fear of God in our hearts, we'll actually learn to embrace it. You see, many people scoff at fear God. Fear God? What are you talking about? God is love. They don't have a healthy understanding of what the scripture means when it says in context to fear God. God. Psalm chapter 19, verse 9 says, The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous all together. Do you see? It's the holy fear of God that cleans you out from a dirty place. It takes the dirt, the grip, the grime, the muck, all of the, the, the bad stuff that the world tries to put on you, and a holy fear of God cleanses you from that because the holy fear of god is going to keep you from doing foolish things just like a child who has a healthy fear of their parents that healthy fear of their parents is going to keep them from doing things they know not they shouldn't do like running with the wrong cats in the street nah man mama told me don't hang out with cats like that daddy said don't hang around with boys like that because it's not good for me it's not good for my soul when they have a healthy fear of their parents, they're going to stay clear of that stuff. But when they have no fear of their parents, they're engaging with any and everybody. How we get rumors and people that are sleeping around and things of that nature, man, because there was never no fear in the home. 
Not just having a reverence for God, but having a healthy fear of the Lord benefits us in so many ways. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. And this is why I'm drilling it down, because it's this important, church. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. So you see, how can you gain, how can you gain wisdom? How can, you, how can you receive wisdom, the revelation of wisdom from God, if you don't fear Him? You're not going to have any wisdom of God. You're not going to have wisdom of the things of God if you don't have a holy fear of them. But if you actually understand, man, he actually created me. He actually is the one that's going to tell me when my life is over. My life is in his hands. I better get on his schedule and his game plan because that's the best place for me. Then you're going to start to get all kind of revelation and all kind of insight and all kind of wisdom. And while all these people are clowning around doing all this nonsense around you, you're going to be able to be like that cat in that room with the wooden uh, you know, floor and marbles all over. And you're going to be able to walk circumspectly around all these problems. And you're not going to be standing all, hitting all these landmines off in your life because you're like, uh-oh, I ain't going there. I ain't going there. I'm going to go there. <laughs> Is that real, church? But it starts with the holy fear of God. We have to ask for this. If you don't have it today, ask him. He'll give it to you. Trust me. <laughs> He'll give it to you. And you'll be like, man. I won't even get into it. You know, if you want to know, I'll share with you later. But I, I've had that experience a long time ago, and I wasn't even saved. And it was crazy. It was a crazy experience. I'll never forget it. The sacrifice of fools. He says, draw near to him rather than give the sacrifice of fools. The sacrifice of fools is just thoughtless speech. Solomon counsels us to, to, to come to the house of God to hear more than to speak and be uh, not, 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 not to speak without thinking. Again, we talked about this earlier. Do you ever just do that? Talk for the sake of talking? No, no purpose at all behind what you say, just run in your mouth? You see, youngsters tend to do this. I remember being a teenager and, you know, I would hear someone talk who I thought was cool and, and I would just emulate that and I would just copy that and I just start saying words. Oh, yeah, you know what I mean? Lingo, whatever, jargon. No rhyme or reason, just trying to fit in and be cool. But here uh, in the Hebrew, this, this, this phrase to hear has a double force, which means something that it does in the English, to pay attention and to obey. So this saying comes close to what Samuel said in, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, when he said, And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen better than the fat of rams. You see, it, 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 he wants us to be obedient. He don't care about the money. <laughs> He, he don't he don't care about, oh, I did X, Y and Z. I, I, I fed the poor. I did that. Those are all good things. But it's like, again, we have to be in tune with God. Did, did God called you to feed those people? Maybe God called you to do this. You know, how many pastors burn the candle at both ends and their families are sacrificed because they're always doing ministry, but then they're not ministering their home. Again, you cannot minister in the church if your house is not in order. And, 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 and the great Martin Luther actually said, preceding preaching comes the house in order, which he got from the word of God. So the word of God says that if my house is not in order, I am not equipped to do this. I should not be in this <laughs> if my house is not in order. And look at the countenance of a wife or a husband. That's how you know what's really going on. It'll it'll speak volumes. <laughs> if you want to know what's going on in my home, look at my wife. Her countenance will let you know if things are good between me and her. And if things are not, then I got to get right before the Lord. That's just, it just is what it is. There's no way around it. Sacrifice. One form of sacrifice was an offering and killing just for the meal, in contrast to the whole burnt offering, which was a total consuming of the sacrifice. The first type of sacrifice can usually become denigrated into a thoughtless Festivity, And that's what he's trying to get Israel away from, saying, don't let it get to that point. Don't let it lose its quality. He goes on to say, don't be rash with your mouth. God is in heaven and you're on earth, for let your words be few. Solomon rightly described the human tendency to speak without thinking before God and others. The application is this. It is foolish to speak too much and to hear too little in God's presence. 
Many times we come before God and our minds are full of our own busyness rather than with the worship of God. If we talk too much, we usually talk like fools. It's especially bad regarding the Lord and being in his house. An example of this is when the priests of Baal, they prayed hard and long on Mount Carmel. Elisha prayed short and sweet and full of faith to the living God. God did not hear the priests of Baal, but he heard Elisha's um, and answered his prayer. Jesus taught us how to pray in Matthew chapter 6, 9 through 13. And this is important, church, to understand. The order in how we speak to Father God is extremely important. We'll look at this portion of Scripture. Matthew chapter 6, 9 down through 13. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Notice, church. From start to finish, the whole bottle of prayer is rooted in spiritual needs, not material or physical needs. Does this mean that we can never pray for a physical blessings? Not at all. But we must be aware that physical blessings are not the primary focus. To be truly blessed means to be fulfilled and content in our relationship with Yahweh regardless of our outward circumstances. You see, many times we think peace is controlling our environment. Controlled environment, I got peace. That's not peace. That's makeshift, that's fake. Real peace is my circumstances are ballistic, but yet I'm walking with the peace of God through chaos in my life. That's real peace. That's godly peace. Controlled environment, that's, that's here on earth. Man trying to be God. Being truly blessed has nothing to do with what I have, but instead in whom I'm in. But that's the deception to believe you're blessed simply because your outward circumstances are favorable to you. But what happens when the whole world seems to be crashing down upon you? Are you still blessed then? You see, the Bible tells us that Father God knows what we truly need before we even speak. Matthew chapter 6, verse 7 and 8 says, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. The Bible also tells us if we truly seek after God simply to be made whole in him, then everything else we truly need will be added on to us. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. This is exactly in line in how Jesus taught us how to pray. Everything in the Lord's prayer is rooted in the spirit, that our inner person would become strong in Jesus Christ so that we would honor Father God and ask his will to be done and not our own. To have the strength and love in Christ to forgive our enemies and to bless them. It has nothing to do with getting a new job or getting a new car or getting into the right school or even getting married. I truly believe what the scripture says that if we seek after the Lord with all of our hearts, he will supernaturally impart the discernment and wisdom we need to make every effective decision in life. If we truly seek after him first, he will always supply us with everything we need at every and any given moment. And the last, last part of this message here, it says, A dream comes through much activity, and a fool's voice is known by his many words. Just as being too busy gives you nightmares, so being a fool makes you a blabbler or babbler. <laughs> Hence, Babel, Tower of Babel, right? All chatty, chatty caddies wanted to make a tower to reach heaven. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 6, verse 45, The good person out of the good treasure of his or her heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil, for out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. You see, our worldview shapes our hearts to either be subjected to the authority of Jesus Christ or to rebel against him. Ultimately, the way you and I think about Jesus will affect the way we actually think about ourselves. And since the mind is the battlefield, 
How we think affects our hearts. Proverbs chapter 23 verse 7 says, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. Learning how to keep silent at the proper time is a virtue and of great value. Proverbs chapter 17 verse 28 says, Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. May we be those who learn to control our tongue in the private lives that we live before Father God and publicly amongst him and those around us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for just the revelation of your word, the truth of what it is to be quiet before you and to have a holy fear of you. Father, I ask that you would just do a mighty work in amongst your people, that we would just come before you. And know that all of our protection...